The work in biogeometry that we are making public today in North America, and has only been public for a very short period of time, through the work that I have done with Dr. Kareem, we have formed the essence of biogeometry, the foundation training of biogeometry, into three different levels. The first level is two days. And level one is dedicated to teaching the student the frame of reference that the Egyptians have in their understanding of biogeometry that make all the practical techniques possible in levels two and three. So the first two days are to give a background, a context, a frame of reference by which we can understand exactly why the techniques of levels two and three work as powerfully and effectively as they do. We'll start with a very quick overview of some of the past history that biogeometry comes out of. In ancient Egypt, there is a tradition known as the Masters of the Net. And what I have here are various depictions from the Egyptian temple walls. The first is from the Temple of Karnak. Now this illustration from the uh, Temple of Karnak appears in a book by the great Egyptologist Schwaller de Lubitz. And in that text, he gives the title to this particular illustration, Thoth, Master of the Net at Karnak. Now Thoth is the Greek name for the initiator of the Egyptian spiritual culture, who the Egyptians refer to as Jehute, or Tehaute. And this being of Thoth or Tehaute is shown stretching a cord. And this act of stretching a cord was a fundamental act in the Egyptian mysteries to create a sacred space, the foundation of creating a temple or other grounding of spiritual essence into the physical world. From our perspective, what we can see with that stretching of the cord that Tehaute is doing on the temple wall is that it is going from an infinitesimal point, a center which has the spiritual essence because the spiritual world is non-physical and non-dimensional and moving that into the dimensions of physical space so that the stretching of the cord goes from that infinitesimal point which connects beyond space and time to the divine essences that make up the world and then moves that out to the first dimension of space into length. And then it can move out into breadth and into depth and into the three dimensions that make up our physical world. So it's related to this entire mystery of how does the non-manifest spiritual world give rise to the physical world in which we live. Now this other illustration here is also in Schwaller de Lubitz's work. And what he shows here is that behind this picture that you will see on the Egyptian temple wall at Karnak is in fact a grid pattern. And in fact this grid pattern is well known to modern Egyptologists. Before they would create the illustrations on the temple walls, the ancient Egyptians would use this grid pattern to know exactly where to put the figures according to a particular canon of proportion. Now this is a very deep topic. In the work that I teach in sacred geometry, we in fact go into the background of this masters of the net lineage from Egypt and into the Jewish Kabbalah in Israel and into the Greek mysteries, into the New Testament, the Holy Grail, etc. For our work in biogeometry, we're only going to touch on this very briefly. But one thing that I can bring out about it for our purposes here is that the stretching of the cord shown here with Thoth or Tehaute creating this dimensional movement from the center into the physical world is also related to this concept of the net. Now this concept of the net and the idea that these are the masters of the net essentially means that these Egyptian initiates are being taught that there is an invisible blueprint of energy that makes up everything in our manifest world. In different traditions around the world they have a name for this invisible blueprint or invisible matrix of energy that is geometric in nature, has particular shapes to it, and that makes up everything in our world. For instance, in the Hindu tradition, they speak of the jeweled net of Indra. And there's also the net taught in the Greek mysteries that gave rise to the mysteries of the New Testament. But what we need to take away from it right now is simply this idea that there is an invisible blueprint of energy that the Egyptian initiates were taught to recognize and work with directly. 
So if we look at the third illustration here, also taken from an Egyptian uh, temple illustration, it shows two people holding nets and the hieroglyphs that accompany it. When we translate into English, it says something along the lines of, these initiates are being taught how to catch and cast magic in their nets. So that the mastery of the net was the mastery of the invisible energy blueprint of our world. And you can even find in other Egyptian texts, such as the very famous Egyptian Book of the Dead, also known as the Book of Coming Forth by Day, where in chapter 153, there's a detailed analysis of the net that the initiate understands and which allows them to move through the physical and spiritual worlds with complete consciousness. So this Masters of the Net lineage, as a final summary, is teaching the initiate in the Egyptian mysteries to be able to recognize, understand, and create practical effects in our world with this invisible blueprint of energy. This is a slide that was given to me by Dr. Karim on the netter pharaoh energy interaction. Here's another illustration from an Egyptian temple wall. And what it shows is a being that in English translations is normally referred to as a god or a goddess. But in the original Egyptian hieroglyphs, these beings, these superhuman beings, are referred to as netters, N-T-R. The ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic language did not have vowels, only consonants, such as ancient Hebrew had. So these netters, the term netter is a foundation for our modern English term nature. So that when I speak to Dr. Karim about this, what he tells me is that rather than translating this as a god or a goddess, we would more deeply understand the Egyptian perspective by understanding that these are netters or forces of nature. They are laws or powers of nature. And the different netters all hold specific qualities of energy that the initiate then interacts with. Now from my perspective, it's important to note that when we talk about these netters as being powers of nature, that does not mean that they are some blind abstract force. Because in our culture, when we talk about laws of nature, it's just some type of abstract thing that just happened to arise in the physical world with no connection to consciousness, no connection to spirit. But it wasn't like that for the Egyptians. When we say that these are forces of nature, for the ancient Egyptians, these forces of nature, these netters, are fully conscious beings. And they can be interacted with in a fully conscious way. So it's important to understand that for the ancient Egyptians, there was no dichotomy between a power of nature and a conscious being. Now the important thing for us here in showing the interaction between the netter and the pharaoh is that there's an intermediary between this power of nature, the power of the netter, and the human initiate, the pharaoh. And that is the form that is held within the hand of the netter. There's the form here of a scepter known as the waz, and the form of the ankh, which is very well known today in Egyptian study circles. What Dr. Karim brought out for me about this is that these shapes that are held in the hand of the netter are actually geometric energy emitters. Now what I mean by that is that the actual shape of the objects themselves give rise to precise energies through which the Egyptian initiates could interact with the forces of nature and apply them for specific purposes. So when you look at illustrations on the Egyptian temple walls, if they show a plant, an animal, a scepter, a geometric form of some kind associated with a netter or one of these beings, we should always examine that because it will show us the particular quality of energy held by that being.